I am interested sometimes in some of our own perceptions of what we see in the Word of God, of how we look at things, and maybe how we mistake things for what we think they are, as opposed as opposed instead of deposed, <laughs> as opposed to what they actually are. One of the things that I find interesting about church is that there's lots of them, and I like that. Some people think that that means that there's some kind of mistake or some kind of error being made by, oh, some pastor of a different type of church, or that because there's so many denominations, there can't be a unity in the body of believers, or because there's some teaching that's popular right now going around that might be in error, you know, might be a complete mistake. You know, for instance, like trying to deny that there's a hell. That's kind of serious. But one of the interesting things that I found is that I really don't have to worry about that. Because you see, I didn't start that church, and I'm certainly not going to finish that church. Oh, I may attend that church. Who knows? I may come visit your church. But if I came into a church that I hadn't started, I wouldn't expect to be in charge of that church. But if I had started that church, I would expect to be in charge of that church. Because, you see, that's kind of the way that you would think some of the structure goes. Now, when churches have been around a long time, they go through a different process of people being in charge. And I always find that interesting because Jesus, in dealing with who's in charge and whose church and what church and types of churches, simply had followers. You know, he had nowhere to really build a church, and yet he said upon this rock or upon this statement that he made that he would build his church and that even the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Because what Jesus was talking about was something that could not be seen, that was the kingdom of heaven, that could not be contained, that would be greater than the differences that we hold between each other, or that we separate on issues of worship or preferences. You know, I find it interesting that in the beginning, the children of Israel started off with really talking to God direct. And then later they had prophets and they had judges and gradually they had kings, you know, and as each different succession of different style of government was over the children of Israel, you notice also there was God revealing himself in a different way to each one. It seemed as though that when the people were directly talking to God, God talked direct to them. Then when they began to distance themselves, they began to get farther and farther away from God. How you see in the beginning it was Adam, you know, having immediate interpersonal relationship with God, you know, talking to him, walking with him, in the cool of the day, daily having a relationship with God. And you notice how gradually that changed, that when man became more interested in his own ways as opposed to God's ways, God judged man because once man had gotten to the place of doing his own thing, he became violent in his ways. He promoted violence and all the thoughts of his own mind were violent. So God chose to eliminate man from the world. Of course, that might be a warning to each and every one of us about violence and choosing violent means to solve a peaceful end. The end doesn't justify the means. And you can't take war and try to create peace. It doesn't work that way. But we find in our relationship with God as we examine the scriptures applicable means to look at what he had done in the past and learn from those things so that we might not make the mistakes in the future or even today. And so I see how after dealing with man in his violent ways, God still spared one man, Noah. And in dealing with that, he brought him through a challenging experience and brought him out on the other side. And then afterwards I noticed how God didn't quite deal with man the same way. 
man was always reaching to God, you know, and at times God was intervening, but I don't see him like quite the same as he was with the Garden of Eden and talking to man direct. So then God began to work through prophets and priests, you know, those that seemed to serve the Lord, you know, and had a relationship, but not everyone had that relationship. And there seemed to be kind of like a difference. And the people began to follow what the person who had a relationship with God said or did. And so there seemed to be that type of development going on with the people and with God and with his servants. And so there seemed to be kind of like a three-part system there, kind of like interesting the way that it was working. And then the people began to want something more as the other nations seemed to have, and they became more likened them to the world. And it seemed as though they began to do things that were right in their own eyes. And then they began to have judges that judged them according to what they were doing wrong, and then would also do what they were doing right and to deliver them, you know, to rescue them. Then it gradually became where they had a king, you know, and they began this whole kingship thing of ruling over the separation of one nation as opposed to another nation and that they would be separate and that they would have one person to rule over them. And then I see the deterioration of that even growing more so. Even likewise the happenings in the, the way that God presented himself instead of it being just the prophet then suddenly we had the prophet and the priest. We had the priest who was doing duty of a pattern of something that God said, this is what it's like in heaven, let me show you. And he gave us the tabernacle that God would be in the midst of his people so that instead of being in fellowship with each individual person or working through the priest or the prophet, now he became in an objectified way, something that you could see and you knew that God was there because his presence went with you. His pillar of fire by night, his pillar of cloud by day, you know, something that's straight up and, you know, kind of obvious in the middle of the center of the camp, so that you always knew that God was there. And he occupied a location or interlocution spot, which we would call the Ark of the Covenant. It was kind of like interlocuted because God wasn't actually in the Ark or on the Ark. God worked through the Ark in order to manifest himself and his presence. And so he used that as a demonstration of his holiness. And it's interesting that God chose to have the people and wanted that intimacy and they chose not to have that when they were at Sinai. And so he separated himself from the people and their sins separated them even farther. And the people chose not to be intimate with God. And I find that interesting that this was all things that were done by the people's choice often more so than God's choice. Because to me it seems as though all along God was trying to get the point across. Intimacy with God was available to them if they would just be intimate with God. And yet the people didn't want it. They were hiding. They were fearful. They were afraid. As I watched this tabernacle of God being with his people, gradually migrate or change and be assimilated into the entire world, I find that the world got entirely involved in that with which was set aside for his people to do. The priesthood became more like the worldly ways and they became more of the world and then there was the lost value of human life in the sense that the priest would now kill those that were not of God, that were still chosen by God, and that they would do it in the name of God. And I'm shocked to see how a priesthood could go from knowing God to killing for God and bring violence into the church. And so I saw how that would develop in the Maccabeans, you know, and, and how sad that was when the combination of being a priest and a king was unified in one family and how corrupted that became. And the presence of God, we're told, deserted the temple. And it was no longer there. And they were told that there was a miracle that was invented by the priests that wasn't true but a lie. And how the priests themselves, having gotten into being a priest and a king, would lie to the people. And how the people 
did not know that they were being lied to. And so in that I find interesting that about that time God sent his son so that once again restoration of a relationship with God would be brought back to an intimate fellowship and Jesus himself constantly always kept pushing this whole idea of knowing the Father, doing the Father's will. The Father loves, the Father cares, the Father has given grace, the Father is doing this, the Father is doing that. I only do my Father's will. And Jesus made it obvious that he was not here to set up his church, but that his church would stand, and that his Father had set up a kingdom for him, and that he was a king also, and that he was being a king and a person representing God physically in the flesh, being God himself as God and is God and ever shall be, then he also revealed that he was a servant, that he was the son of man too. So he combined the two to make them one and he kept telling us and teaching us that it was about the unity, about the coming together, about the assembling together so that we would be with God and God would be with us and that it was obvious and that we didn't have to look about and to try to say who's doing right or wrong even as John proclaimed that Jesus was coming in John never stopped teaching John never stopped preaching it's interesting that we don't pay that close attention to what John was still doing when Jesus was alive Jesus goes into the desert you know gets to be tempted of the devil and you know challenged and offered all kinds of kingdoms to see if he would fail or if he would be God's representative God in the flesh, God with us, even as the tabernacle is with us, and now the temple has been deserted and there's no presence of God except in the person of Jesus. So the presence of God had left the temple, and now it was in a person, demonstrating to us what God wanted to do with us, God in us. And so I find it interesting that somehow it's always been one-on-one. Always. Whether you look from Genesis all the way through Revelation or you get to the place of the New Jerusalem coming down and God is in the midst of New Jerusalem, you don't see really God being distant or God being exclusive to the priest, the prophet, the king, the elder, the deacon, the whoever. God wanted to be intimate, his father, with every one of us. God wants that intimacy to be the reality of what church is, of what God is, of what Jesus said we could have in the reality of the knowledge of the Son of God by demonstrating to us His total dependence and His reliance as well as His love with His Father who was in heaven. So much so that He called Him Abba, Daddy called him the most intimate words that we could think of to use and yet somehow we we shy away from that again when we get from like you got home bible studies and it's kind of nice you know you get these little home bible study groups and people get intimate and real and they get kind of sometimes clickish sometimes a little you know family oriented and it's kind of nice then you get a few families together and you just like hey let's have a church you know let's have a, a building we can go to and worship God and do more and be more and I wonder are we sacrificing on the altar of our religious expression the intimacy of our tender relationships that we should have in the reality of what church is meant to be I see Jesus walking in the midst of the seven candelabras, if you want to call them that, the seven lampstands, the seven menorahs, technically is what they are. And I see Jesus walking in the midst of them and blessing, challenging, questioning, determining, but speaking to those that are in the church. Oh, he starts off addressing what the church has done, but he always brings the reality of speaking to the one in it, the overcomer of it, the person who's in the church and of the church. And so I find that intimate relationship of God walking in the midst of it still there. And God's saying things that makes me aware that church is about having intimate relationships 
not just with God only, but with His Son, with the Spirit, with my community, with the people, with those to whom God has set the church in that city, in that place, in that time, in that need. I find reading this, you know, fascinating. You know, I get I get more excited the more I read it, you know, the more I study it and the more I talk about it. Because really when I talk about it, I get the chance to think it through. And I get to consider the things that Jesus said about his church, about his bride, about his body of Christ. And each one of those are different. They're not all the same. So don't think that they're just words that are mixed over and mixed in and they come out somehow different. No, I see the three parts of what God had done, you know, as being like in the tabernacle, you know, where he met with lots of people, but from a distant point of view, through the priest. Or like in the temple, where he met with lots of people, but through the venue of the feasts that God had ordained that would be there forever. And I see him in the New Jerusalem, where he will be in the midst of his people as the light. And I find interesting that we who build churches or who design the idea behind what we're going to do with God, you know, have at times struggled with and done things that weren't possibly correct because we did things in a religious way as opposed to a prayerful consideration of what God would make for a determination of the direction that we should go. I have been to synagogues, I mean, participated in them. I'm, an active member of a synagogue. Um, I have been in Orthodox community, in communities, what we call it. Um, I have been in Israel, you know, to Greek Orthodox Church, to uh, not participate but visiting, you know, and to Russian Orthodox and to Coptic and to uh, Gypsy Church, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> the whole long story there, and to Messianic groups and to Reform Temple and to conservative, you know, and I have been to probably the most craziest, you know, like Pentecostal churches I've ever seen in my life, you know, some of the strangest things that I've ever seen, and I've been to some of the ones that were like acceptable, you know, that were like, oh, vineyards, or I've been a part of the early Jesus movement, you know, with the Calvary Chapel movement, you know, at the big Calvary, you know, and always, you know, find myself enjoying that at different times in my life as God sends me there to be a part, you know, and help to develop, you know, whatever may be going on at the time. And I've enjoyed that aspect of that life, part of my life. And I've been a part of the Messianic movement, you know, in the early days with, you know, Moshe Rosen on the internet, you know, well, Mitty Mo and a bunch of us, you know, we're all using the internet in order to discuss, to relate, to investigate, to promote, to open up the doors of communication so that there would be evangelization, you know, to those that were without so that they would come within and know Jesus in a personal way. You know, I've been a part of, you know, the Chosen People Ministries, helping them in Alaska to reach out to the churches there to demonstrate what God is doing in the Jewish people. I've been a part of a lot of different movements and you know, the different pastors that I've met in different venues and different places and seen how God had used them and touched them in the Catholic Church, in the Protestant Church, in the Lutheran Church, in the Foursquare, in Quakers, in a lot of places that most people would go, I didn't know God was there. I didn't know God was there. I didn't know God was, God was there. I've seen it. I'm a witness. There's no doubt. When I see these men of God, and I've known them, and I've met them, and I've talked to them, whether it be a Rick Warren or whether it be a trying to think of somebody that somebody would think is off the wall, you know, um, Morris Cirillo, <laughs> you know, the moments I met these people, these men of God. They're with God. There's no doubt about it. You know when you meet them. You talk to them. If you have conversation, if you see an observation, you're able to tell them. You're able to tell. You know without any question in your mind. These men are men. 
not only have these men been with God, but these men have gone forward to do what God has told them to do. And you see, if there is such a thing as a church model, as a church venue, as something that is unspoken, but really is a token of what church is, it's doing what God tells the person to do. Really. That's what church is. It's doing what God tells you to do. Now, I'll admit, there are people that go to church and they can hear a message and they can get something out of it. It has nothing to do with what the pastor said, but it has to do with what God told them to do. I'll admit, people can go and pray and lay hands and do things that they never would have thought to do at home because they're doing what God told them to do. I'll admit, people can you know, do the slam them, jam them, you know, whatever, and even some churches damn them stuff. But they're doing what God told them to do because, you see, Jesus made an interesting statement about church, about following him, about John the Baptist. Jesus' disciples were challenged often by their own preconceived ideas, what they thought was right and what God said was true. Now, obviously, we look at it now and we say, oh, well, you know, they were just like, they didn't know any better. They weren't righteous. Well, they did know better. They knew a lot of things. They were there. They saw, they heard, they experienced, and they were challenged by direct confrontation of what Jesus was doing in their life in order that later they would remember it. It would hit home as an object lesson very directly so that they could be ready for the times that we have not recorded when they would go through massive persecution and eventually die all but John. And even John died eventually. But they would suffer greatly for the sake of being those that God had walked with and talked with and shared intimately the knowledge and the personal insights into what God meant and what Jesus said. And so I find it really interesting that when we look at that we discover something more to church than what we think we understand because we say, well, you know, we do this and they do that, you know, you don't do that. Well, no. Jesus said, look, who's not against me is for me. And the disciples came to him and said, Hey, we saw John bat John, you know, John's disciples are out there baptizing, you know. And as a matter of fact, they were out there teaching. And they were teaching some wrong doctrine, you know, they were screwing up. They didn't they didn't get it. But we got it because we got you. So since we got you, we went over and we told him, Look, we got Jesus, so you know, we're telling you that you can't be teaching this. You're wrong. You're off the wall. You you don't do that. And Jesus rebuked them. You know, it's like, boy, talk about, you know, wiping out his cheering section. Talk about, you know, like slaughtering the sheep, you know, and just wiping them out. You know, he says, no, wrong. You don't do that. No man can receive what they have received except to be given to them of my Father. And God, the Son, always trusted the fact that God was in control of all, every detail, even the wind blowing. Dare I say more? Even the hurricanes showing what force of nature they're from, but still God in control. Need I say more? Or the tornadoes, or the earthquakes, or the lightning, or the thunder, or the rains. Need I say more? Because if God isn't in control, the vain religion. It's just philosophical ideas that have been strung together based upon the human experience and the psyche of humanity as opposed to the reality of God intervening in the nature and the structure of man's own choices that he's making. So a lot of people, they didn't get it, and they still don't sometimes. They get the idea that Jesus is in control, but they don't get the idea that God, the Father, wants us to know, let it go. In other words, you see somebody out there doing something in the name of the Lord, let it go. You see somebody else doing something in the name of the Lord that, you know, Jesus says, you know, hey, you know, don't touch him. Let it go. You see something that you see is wrong, you know, say it's wrong, but then let it go. That's all. Walk away. Go where God wants you to go and do what God wants you to do, and you will be the church, wherever you are, whatever you are, as you are. 
but god might choose you also in that way if you're sitting there you know on your computer doing nothing except you know venting god might make you into a church and say look follow me and i'll make you into a church otherwise put up or shut up because it's time to quit tearing down and it's time to build up the body of christ it's time to get out of the business of isolating so many people because we're saying, oh, you can't do that. Instead of saying, hey, if God's telling you, go for it. You know, God bless you. Be at peace. You know, I may not go with you, but you know, you go as God tells you to do. And then trust the Lord for the results. Let God do what he chooses to do with the person, the church, the denomination, the aspect of life that we're not giving credit to God to let him do as he directs his church. Because after all, Jesus said it best, no man can receive that which he has been given except it be given to him of my Father. So really, what are you doing? Is it what the Lord told you to do? And so now you are the church? Or are you making your own church because you're not doing what Jesus said or what his Father in heaven said to do?